cost was by, was by, hey, let's pay more ass when, if we absolutely have to. I never heard in my life of somebody saying it's not worth it to check it out. Come on. Four grand is four grand. How much trouble is it to check out a $4,000 expense? Maybe, what, half an hour? You know, if it took Win Mather, if it took Win Mather 15 hours to put together the reconciliation, why did it take her nine months to do it? Win Mather was here to be rehabilitated in technical terms, in legal terms, to be rehabilitated as a witness, because she has very little credibility. I didn't see her rehabilitated when she got here. Looked to me like it was a person who very much did not like having to be here and was here against her just because she had to be. Underlying what's going on in this whole situation is antipathy, dislike, what can we do next to make life more difficult for Patrick Mraz? It's not just about underpayments, it's failure to timely account. That's why you have accountants in life. Because when Mraz got thrown out of the group, How's he supposed to know what his deficit is and why he has a deficit or anything else? Why didn't he know he had a deficit the previous two or three years? These people know everything about his life. He knows, he doesn't know what's going on because they, they're in control. They get the money, they decide. It's a piggy bank for the four Moody Blues. <laughs> but for him, he has to go, oh, please, can I have my next advance until it got to a point where, hey, look, you're out of here. Goodbye. Thank you. There you have the plaintiff's rebuttal. After the rebuttal was given, the judge gave the jury instructions, and they deliberated for about a half an hour that day before going home for the evening. That night, the Moody Blues flew home for the Christmas holiday. You remember, this is uh, almost Christmas Eve. We're going to take a short break. When we return, we're going to listen to the jury verdict in the case. Stay with us. Well, the jury deliberated for about a half an hour on December 23rd. They returned on Christmas Eve, and they deliberated for about four hours while the ju judge heard arguments on the equitable issues from both the attorneys. Then they went home for the Christmas holidays. They were returned on December 28th to resume their deliberations. After two and a half hours, they returned and announced they had a verdict. Let's go to the courtroom and listen to their verdict. Okay, appears to be in order. Yes, the uh, clerk, please. Read the verdict. Title of Court and Cause. We, the jury in the above entitled action, find for the plaintiff, Patrick Moraz, and against the defendants, Threshold Records, LTD, Talancora Limited, Ray Thomas, Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, the Moody Blues, and assess damages in the amount of $77,175, no cents. Dated December 28, 1992, Rolando Klein, four person. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is this your verdict? Yes. Thank you. Okay, do you wish the uh, jurors polled? Yes. Yes, okay. Ladies and gentlemen, well, there you have it. The jury awarded Morales $77,175 in royalties from the Moody Blues. I should note that that was a different judge there, you might notice, because the other judge, Judge Bowen, who presided over the trial, was on vacation, so a different judge took the verdict. Stephen, boy, it's quite a come down for any, for any plaintiff to sit there and have 77000 when you're expecting close to $4 million. I might add that uh, he was apparently offered about $400,000 on the eve of trial and refused it. That's called a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the verdict? Did it seem like they just they denied that they split the difference? The jury did, but he asked for around 140 in the final analysis, and they gave just about half of that. Right. Of course, the way the numbers work out does lay, raise a real suspicion that the jury just split the numbers, and that may be because they were confused. What What do you think happens in that jury room? Did they just end up going in there, and they they couldn't consider those issues, so they just had to go with it with the numbers and just jiggle the numbers around and see where they went. They didn't take all that much time to decide it. When you, when you add it all up, it comes to about, I don't know, four, five, six, seven hours? I think that relates to the point that Mr. Engel made about sometimes there being jury confusion. Many times jurors are confused, and they may have been very much confused by the numbers and just gone in there and finally effectively thrown up their hands and just split the difference. Is there an appeal on this? Uh, there can be an appeal if there's a basis for it. The question is whether or not there is some in propriety in the way the judge ruled during the trial, or the judge's rulings on the counsel throughout, uh, or whether the 
decision of the jury is so far away from the evidence that no reasonable person could have done that. However, the number of times when these jury verdicts were overturned is proportionally very small. Really? Now we have, we have uh, some of the declarations, two of the jurors made declarations to the attorney after the trial saying that they believe that there was a wrongful termination of the contract. They believe Patrick Moraz. Mm -hmm. They didn't. They both thought the Moody Blues were, were trying to, to get him out for their own greedy reasons. Does the statement of two of the jurors help an appeal in any way? I don't see how it's going to really get in the, into the, uh, before the appellate court because generally the appeals court decides the appeal based upon what happened at the trial. And the statements of the jurors typically would not go to the appeals court. So I'm not sure what Mr. Johnson's theory is in getting it before the appeals court. Maybe there is some basis under California law for doing that, but I think it's unlikely that the appeals court will hear the, these declarations. Well, we are going to now go to some interviews that we did, that a reporter in California did, with the participants after the verdict. The first person that he spoke to was Neville Johnson, who of course represented Patrick Morales throughout the trial. I have said from day one that uh, this was going to be a personal ad hominem attack from Mr. Engel. He's made it clear from the beginning that he was, that he was out to try and destroy me individually. Uh, it may have had something to do with the fact that uh, he finds it so distasteful to be representing these defendants. I also believe that Mr. Engel was unprepared. He came into the case three weeks ago, and the sign of an attorney who's you know, what an attorney, the sign of an attorney who's unprepared is attack opposing counsel. That's what he did. Of course, if you've been watching the trial, you know there's been a lot of animosity between the attorneys in the case, and the judge has chided them on that. Now we're going to have the interview after the verdict with Don Engel, who represented the Moody Blues, and he was asked what he thought about Johnson's behavior during the trial and what the jury may have thought about Johnson's behavior. Here's his answer. In my 30 years of practice, I've never seen behavior like that. The jury doesn't see that. The jury thinks that's the way you do it. You wave your hands, you make wild charges. Uh, there was a threat to dismiss this case if he did it again. But you've got a judge who's a, who doesn't want to prejudice the client and went along with it. I don't fault the judge. I think he was overwhelmed. They don't really know that Mr. Johnson's behavior was inappropriate. The judge didn't admonish him in front of the jury. The best one juror said we thought the judge was a little annoyed with him. But this is the justice system, and it just wasn't shown in a good light. Well, during this trial, we had the opportunity to talk to the jury foreman in the case. His name is Rolando Klein, and he was asked what he thought of Moraz, Johnson, Engel, and the case. So here's his answer. The most credible witness was Patrick Moraz, uh, and uh, there was a lot of emotionalism uh, among the jurors in favor of Patrick Moraz because obviously the, the four Moody Blues were taking a strategy of uh, blanking out the, a, a lot of the memory and not remembering a lot of things that may have happened and uh, they were not they did not look credible in the understand and uh, unfortunately there, there wasn't enough we could do to to penalize them for that it, it, that wasn't our job so some of the jurors were frustrated they, they would have liked to to add punitive damages because of their behavior on the stand. Mr. Engels uh, prepared, was much more prepared, much more professional. Uh, he had a strategy and that he followed it uh, <clears throat> very systematically, very coldly. I personally found that Mr. Johnson was um, always looked harassed and always looked unprepared. Uh, somehow, uh, for, to some of the jurors, he looked very passionate and they, they bought that. We had a case where I feel that uh, probably, uh, at least we, were, we had to decide probably uh, expert witnesses that are into accounting could have made a better job than ourselves in determining that amount of money. I think that uh, our emotionalism uh, got on the way. The, the witnesses with the jurors are often the most interesting part of the post-trial verdict. That was fascinating. He, they actually, he says they actually believe Moraz, who, if you remember, the judge chided him for his behavior on the stand, and they wanted to penalize the Moody Blues. In fact, they were so much in favor of, uh, of Moraz that they wanted to add punitive damages, which was not appropriate under the claim that was submitted to them. But they really believed Moraz, and they did not believe the Moody Blues. But they had no room. We should just explain. They had no room to work. They had to work from the documents they had. And since the judge had taken the contract claim away from them, 
they had no choice. It's apparent to me from what Mr. Klein said that they really stretched toward the $77,000 they did, and in that they were going beyond perhaps what they even thought he was due under that claim to try to get him as many dollars as they thought they could. That's amazing because it's sometimes what we see in the courtroom, what the judges see, is not what the jury said. The judge thought that Mraz was behaving badly on the stand and chided him for him. Then you have the jurors thinking that he was wonderful and that's, believable. That's, it's, a, that's, that's amazing. It's really, a very dramatic statement by a juror. I don't recall in any case that I've seen in the past where the jurors have come out and said that they really disbelieve one side so strongly and really found one side to not be credible, mm -hmm. particularly in the light where the claim was not submitted to them. But the judge found that way, and I can't really second guess him. Now, the judge had some things who had to decide after the jury verdict came in. There were certain equitable claims left before him to decide. Those were claims for rescission of the contract and for promissory estoppel. Let's take them one at a time, and we'll first see. He decided as far as rescission, he refused to overturn a 1981 declaration whereby Mraz gave up rights to the band's name. Now. And as far as promissory estoppel, the judge ruled Mraz did not rely on promises by the band to tour in 1991, and he cannot be paid for lost earnings. As far as what's called rescission, Stephen, I think we've been talking about the fact that that was really tough going, right. and particularly in light of the evidence. C can you comment? We've both read the judge's opinion about his statements on rescission. Well, the judge really said, you signed this document in 1981. You represented by a lawyer at the time. You signed numerous contracts after that. To now come in and say it was all a hoax, it just doesn't make it. It's a big burden. The judge says he didn't meet it. He wasn't under any kind of duress when he signed that document. He had a lawyer. He's bound. Now, for promissory estoppel, I'm going to make you explain promissory estoppel. <laughs> Just in, in, an, in an easy way, promissory estoppel, that you rely on the promises to your detriment, I guess. Well, well, what it really is, is a promise that is of such importance that a person would be expected in the ordinary course to rely on it. Here, his claim was that they said to him, Mr. Mraz, you're going to be part of our tour, and that based upon that representation by them, he turned down other opportunities. That really is the basis of promissory estoppel. You told me I would have something. Based on that, I turned down something else I could have done, and you didn't do what you told me you would do. Now, what, what was interesting, and the judge talked about this, and we heard a little bit about it in the testimony of the bookkeeper, Patrick Moraz really didn't record very much on the Moody Blues last album, which was Keys of the Kingdom. In fact, he had a separate agreement there where he didn't even get royalties from that album. The judge pointed to that as saying, look, this is even an indication to you that things were not right or you would have been recording on that album. And he took that to establish that, look, you were, what were you relying on? You really weren't relying on much in that case. And there was no right to promise or estoppel based on that. And also the fact that there was another musician that was filling in for him a lot that was on the stage with him at the it same a, time. It was apparent that this judge just didn't believe that Patrick Moraz thought he was, had, a, re, had a, a representation who would be on the tour. He said, you made other arrangements for alternate employment. You weren't on the album. You knew that there was a real chance you weren't going to be on that tour. And therefore, you weren't relying. Now, since we heard the, the jury foreman, and, and since we have these two statements from the jurors now, is, is there anything that this attorney can do now or that Patrick Moraz can do now with these, to work with these, to, to, help it, to help an appeal? The equitable issues, those are fair game for appeal. Right. Uh, those are fair game for appeal, but those are also addressed to the discretion of the court, mm -hmm. unless there's some clear error on the part of the court. The appellate court tends to say, we'll follow what the lower court did. On the bigger issue, on the oral contract, which is really what, as I understand it, all the money in the claim really exactly. lay, then there, that's where these, these declarations by the two jurors, where the statements by the jury foreman, Mr. Klein, may come into it because they are dramatic. But I still think it's a tough battle. It is. And it's been wonderful having you here tonight, Stephen. It's the first time here, and I hope you'll come back again. And I sure will. Thanks out. very much. Thank you. Well, that's the end of our trial coverage of the Moody Blues case for this evening and the end of the just about half of that. Right. Of course, the way the numbers work out does lay, raise a real suspicion that the jury just split the numbers, and that may be because they were confused. What, what do you think happens in that jury room? Did they just end up going in there, and they, they couldn't consider those issues, so they just had to go with the, with the numbers and just jiggle the numbers around and see where they went? They didn't take all that much time to decide. When you, when you add it all up, it comes to about, I don't know, four, five, six, seven hours? Right. I think that relates to the point that Mr. Engel made about Sometimes there being jury confusion. Many times jurors are confused, and they may have been very much confused by the numbers and just gone in there and finally effectively thrown up their hands and just split the difference. Is there an appeal on this? Uh, there can be an appeal if there's a basis for it. The question is whether or not there is some 
impropriety in the way the judge ruled during the trial, or the judge's rulings on the counsel throughout, uh, or whether the decision of the jury is so far away from the evidence that no reasonable person could have done that. However, the number of times when these jury verdicts were overturned is proportionally very small. This antipathy, dislike, what can we do next to make life more difficult for Patrick Mraz? It's not just about underpayments, it's failure to timely account. That's why you have accountants in life. Because when Mraz got thrown out of the group, how's he supposed to know what his deficit is and why he has a deficit or anything else? Why didn't he know he had a deficit the previous two or three years? These people know everything about his life. He knows, he doesn't know what's going on because they, they're in control. They get the money, they decide. It's a piggy bank for the four Moody Blues. <laughs> but for him, he has to go, oh, please, can I have my next advance until it got to a point where, hey, look, you're out of here. Goodbye. Thank you. There you have the plaintiff's rebuttal. After the rebuttal was given, the judge gave the jury instructions, and they deliberated for about a half an hour that day before going home for the evening. That night, the Moody Blues flew home for the Christmas holiday. You remember, this is uh, almost Christmas Eve. We're going to take a short break. When we Dated December 28, 1992, Rolando Klein, four person. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, is this your verdict? Yes. Thank you. Okay, do you wish the uh, jurors polled? Yes. Yes. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, there you have it. The jury awarded Morales $77,175 in royalties from the Moody Blues. I should note that that was a different judge there, you might notice, because the other judge, Judge Bowen, who presided over the trial, was on vacation, so a different judge took the verdict. Stephen. Boy, it's quite a come down for any for any plaintiff to sit there and have seventy-seven thousand when you were expecting close to four million. I might add that uh, he was apparently offered about four hundred thousand dollars on the eve of trial and refused it. That's called a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of the verdict? Did it seem like they just they denied that they split the difference? The jury did, but he asked for around one hundred and forty in the final analysis, and they the cost was by was by take. Let's pay more ass when if we absolutely have to. I never heard in my life of somebody saying it's not worth it to check it out. Come on. Four grand is four grand. How much trouble is it to check out a $4,000 expense? Maybe, what, half an hour? You know, and if it took Win Mather, if it took Win Mather 15 hours to put together the reconciliation, why did it take her nine months to do it? Wynn Mather was here to be rehabilitated in technical terms, in legal terms, to be rehabilitated as a witness, because she has very little credibility. I didn't see her rehabilitated when she got here. Looked to me like it was a person who very much did not like having to be here and was here against her just because she had to be. Underlying what's going on in this whole situation. In turn, we're going to listen to the jury verdict in the case. Stay with us. Well, the jury deliberated for about a half an hour on December 23rd. They returned on Christmas Eve, and they deliberated for about four hours while the ju judge heard arguments on the equitable issues from both the attorneys. Then they went home for the Christmas holidays. They returned on December 28th to resume their deliberations. After two and a half hours, they returned and announced they had a verdict. Let's go to the courtroom and listen to their verdict. Okay, appears to be in order. Yes, the uh, clerk, please. Read the verdict. <laughs> Title of Court and Cause. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find for the plaintiff, Patrick Moraz, and against the defendants, Threshold Records, LTD, Talancora Limited, Ray Thomas, Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Graham Edge, the Moody Blues, and assess damages in the amount of $77,175. No C. 